Hey, hey, welcome RCC. I'm gonna invite us to our feet this morning. Who breaks our power? We're sin and darkness. Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? RCC, you can be seated. We want to say thank you so very much for joining us this morning. Uh, we are thrilled that you're with us. We also want to ask you to do us a big favor and take one of the Connect cards in the seat backs in front of you. You can also scan the QR code. Hey, but these Connect cards are a great, great way for you to figure out kind of what's going on at RCC, get plugged in. There are a multitude of things that take place uh, here at this church every single day. It's also a great way to figure out, hey, how do I plug into a life group? Which life group do I plug into? And finally, uh, this church believes in the power of prayer. We believe that prayer moves the heart and mind of God to action. And so we want to join you in whatever prayer requests you have. Our leadership, our staff prays over these requests on a weekly basis. Now, whether you know it or not, you all are a big answer to prayer every single day. And this morning, please give a warm welcome to our outreach and missions coordinator, Carmen Queen, as she shares more about that. Hey, family, I just want to thank you. We had an amazing weekend at Journey to the Nativity. Did any of you attend that? 
A huge thank you. There were over 100 volunteers here each night working at the event. And when, I'll, I'll tell you, we started in July with planning and then the construction and the clearing of the land started in September. And you, there are so many hands that went into this. So many of you between baking and land clearing and even one of our elders learning how to start a chainsaw, just saying, didn't hear that from me. Um, but anyways, over the weekend, we had over 2,200 people come through the journey to the nativity and hear the story. And this would not have happened without you. And if you weren't able to attend, I'll just explain. Um, when you went out there, this phenomenal thing happened on our campus. You actually time traveled, really, no, no lie. And you went back into time, and I'm so glad that it was back in the day because they didn't have any child labor laws back then. And I tell you who worked the hardest with baby Jesus. I mean, he worked his diaper off. So I'm so thankful there weren't any child labor laws um, back in that time. But seriously, your generosity to this church to allow things like this to happen for the community, to show hope, to, give, to show joy, and to invite people in and let them know that they have a place at our table is just amazing, and we can't thank you enough. RCC takes um, our finances, your, your giving, your tithing very, very seriously, and we're committed to spreading the gospel. And it's funny, because I actually grew up um, Lutheran, and my family... They, they just didn't really trust the church with finances, and I just remember overhearing conversations about that, you know, not really knowing anything different. And then where I am now and knowing what we're involved in and what we give back to the community and what we support and how many people we help on a daily basis, I mean, there is no better place that you can give your tithes and offerings to this church. I can guarantee that you can have confidence in that. Our budget just for Journey to the Nativity was small. And I was thinking big, and it's kind of like at home. My budget is small, and my husband tells me it's small, and I want big. But um, we reached out to commun the community. We reached out to businesses in the community, um, some restaurants, some individuals. And let me just share with you, I mean, the first thing that happened was two families in RCC donated an entire scene. And there were five scenes back there. And so two of those were already donated, but here's the interactive portion. Everybody hold up your hand like a fist. We're gonna count. I'll wait. Still waiting, there's a few of you. Hold your hand up. <laughs> All right, so count these out with the partners that we had that came and supported our vision for the community. Um, so you can start with two, because we had two families in the church that donated the scenes. Publix, BJ's, Target, Wendy's, Home Depot, Pepper's Restaurant, Hurricanes, O'Charlie's, Dr. Kale's Pediatric, Pediatric Dentistry, O'Connor Development Corporation, Clay Electric, put your feet up, start counting, <laughs> Valancourt Construction, W.D. Gardner LLC Land Clearing, Gordon Chevrolet, Grace Anglican, and if I forgot anyone, I apologize, but isn't that amazing? And if you own a company or a business and you were on this list, send me an email and I will be reaching out next year when we do Journey to the Nativity next year. Um, but seriously, thank you so much for being um, on mission with this church and your tithes and offerings are really extending the kingdom and making a difference in so many people's lives. And because of your generosity, we're on the screen there's four different ways to give at this church and we just, we really cannot thank you enough. Thank you. I absolutely love roller coasters. The bigger, the better. The faster, the more amazing. Recently, I got to ride the Velasa coaster at Universal Studios. This coaster is described as a double launch still coaster that reaches a 155 feet tall mark, has a maximum speed of 70 miles per hour after a beginning that goes zero to 50 miles per hour in three seconds. Some other components of the coaster include a 140-foot plunge and a couple of barrel rolls at 60 miles per hour. Even for someone who loves roller coasters, I was a little bit nervous while standing in line. When I got on the coaster, I was seated next to a little boy who seemed to ooze none of the nervousness and anxiety that I had, but only excitement. 
I asked him if he was afraid, and he said, no way, I'm ready. He asked if I was afraid, and I said, a little. He then very innocently and sincerely asked, do you want me to hold your hand? And although I didn't take him up on his offer, I thought about the little boy's question to me regarding God not taking a hands-off approach to this entire world. God not taking a hands-off approach to my life. God not taking a hands-off approach to our lives. And we come to a time in our service known as communion. And if you weren't able to get the communion elements this morning, we're going to ask at this time that you raise your hands and we have people stationed in the back and front to give you those communion elements. So if you didn't get those, if you can raise your hands and keep them raised at this time until someone brings them to you. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 8, after Adam and Eve made the decision to sin and hide from God, they heard God walking in the garden. They knew this was God because they had grown accustomed to the creator of the universe walking with them. And this is the same God that we love and we serve today. The God who sent Jesus Christ into this world to die for the forgiveness of our sins and to be resurrected so that we too can live resurrected lives. The God who doesn't just hold our hands through the twist, turns, ups, and downs of this world, but the God who has rescued us from our sins and transferred us to the kingdom of Jesus Christ. So this morning, as we eat a cracker that represents the body of Jesus and drink juice that represents the blood of Jesus, may we remember and proclaim that the creator of the universe says this about us and to us in Isaiah 49, verse 16. I love you and I have engraved you on the palm of my hands. Please pray with me. Father, thank you so much that you are not distant from us. Father, that you have chosen not to take a hands-off approach. But Father, you have created this world, you have created us with great interest, with great love, with great purpose, and with great significance. And this morning, as we get to celebrate in communion what Jesus did on the cross, what you did in raising him from the dead, may we live in hope, may we live in celebration, may we live in anticipation of what you continue to do in this world and what you will do in this world. We ask all these things in Jesus' name, amen.
Our church, let's declare it this morning. Let's lift our voice here. Oh, Son of God, Messiah, the Lamb, the 
Amen, church. Amen. Hey, can we welcome all those online right now? Can we welcome everyone online? We love you guys. So glad to have you this morning. Amen. Please be seated. We are so glad to have you. My name is Nathan, and I'm one of the pastors here at RCC. And I tell you what, we've had an amazing, amazing last week. In fact, last Sunday, <clears throat> I want you to see what happened. We, had, we gave out a call to be baptized. And look at this, 29 people last Sunday were baptized in Jesus Christ. 29 people. <clears throat> Amazing right there. And on top of that, what's kind of cool is that there's more coming. Uh, thus far in the year 2021, we've had 96 people get baptized. And also 96 people. And so uh, we're just so humbled and honored to watch how God is definitely moving here at RTC through our church family and through his word. And so we want to continue that tradition as we go through the Christmas. And, you know, we could... I thought about, you know, what can we do different this Christmas as Christmas Eve is coming? I mean, Christmas Eve is probably our biggest service we have, you know, throughout the whole year. And um, we have four options. We got 1.30, we got 3 o'clock. We got 4.30 and we have 6 o'clock. And so we got lots of different options for you to bring your family and your neighbors. But, you know, we thought we'd do something different this year. And who, who here loves being generous? Ra raise your hand if you like being generous. Raise your hand. All right. Raise your hand if you love receiving generosity. Raise your hand. All right. I'm, a, I'm like both. All right. I'm, I'm all about the both then. So here's what we're going to do. God's kind of hardwired us to do this. And so there's people during the season, if there's ever a season they feel lonely, it's during Christmas, right? And so we want to share with them God's love. And so here's what we're doing. We're going to give you out cards right here. And, and here's what it says. Something unexpected to show that God loves you. Our goal this year is to do unexpected things, kind acts for people in our community. And, and on, on the flip side of that, it, it shares about our Christmas Eve service. People need to know that God loves them. Amen. They need a sense at this time of year, and we can be conduits of that. Just think about it. What if hundreds of us, hundreds of us did two acts of random kindness, just two acts of random kindness this year and, and, and said, you know what, I want to leave you this card, something unexpected to show you that God loves you because, you know, he does, and I want to invite you to the unexpected joyful Christmas. That's our theme for this Christmas Eve because God's always doing the unexpected, right? And so we're going to do that for people and his love. Love is extravagant, and we want to do unexpected acts of love to our community. So what we're going to do is we're asking you just to be on the lookout. You're going, okay, what does that look like? Well, when you're at a restaurant, you're leaving a tip. Put extra tip on there and then leave your waitress this card. Hey, guess what? Something unexpected to show you that God loves you. Maybe put an envelope on a, and a money in a card and put this card there and, to let somebody know, you know what, I saw you had a flat tire. I want to go ahead and pay for that or at least help you with that. Here's something unexpected to show you that God loves you. Or give a gift card for babysitting, for free babysitting and put this card with it. Or maybe attach a candy bar or if, or if you're like me, I, I like peppers, all right? Give someone a peppers gift card, all right? It's an amazing restaurant here in our community and let them know that God loves them. Hey, pay for the order behind you. You're in the drive through Pay for the order behind you. Leave this card in the window with the person in the window, and they'll give it to the car behind you. And hey, you know, once again, something unexpected to show you that God loves you. Bake some good, uh, Christmas goodies. Do an act of service. Leave some flowers with this card. Uh, pay for someone's dinner in the restaurant, all right? And, and then tell them, hey, take this to the waitress or waiter. Take this over to them. Let them know that God loves them this Christmas. You think we could do that this Christmas? You think we can bless hundreds and hundreds, even thousands of people this Christmas? I think we can. And, you know, can you imagine the story? So be intentional. Be prepared. We're going to hand you these cards. They really fit in your wallet. They're easy to fit somewhere in your purse, whatever it is that you use. And, and let's do this. Let's let them know that God loves them. And maybe they'll get a unique perspective about God this Christmas that they haven't had in a long time. And I want to encourage you with this. If you do this, share your story. I can't wait to hear all the stories. Uh, if you have a, a photo of what you did, just kind of give us a couple of sentences and then email us at office at riverchristian.church. Office at riverchristian.church. And we would love to hear your stories. And that will help stimulate other stories, all right, and other people doing these incredible acts of kindness. So as we continue on, I want you to know we are in our, 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 our series right now called It Is Written. And, and, our, and our Bible reading comes to this scripture today that kind of is a heart, I think, of who we are here at RCC, especially what we're looking to do with this right here this Christmas. 
I, I, wherever I'm at, I get into the local sports. I'm a big sports guy, and I love looking at teams. And one of those when I was in Phoenix was Arizona State University's basketball team. And they did something that was really unique. I've never seen it before. They came up with a concept called the curtain of distraction. Have you heard about this? The curtain of distraction. Here's what happened. Every time the opposing team, the visiting team, would shoot a free throw, they would bring out this makeshift curtain, and they would open it up. And while the guy's getting ready to shoot the free throw, random things would come out of the curtain, like, like this right here, like an Elvis impersonator would come out of the curtain. All right? One time, like a cowboy on top of a cow, which makes perfect sense to me, uh, he came out of a curtain. All right? Another time, a, a Santa came down from the chimney out of the curtain during Christmas. And then on top of that, one time, a, a, a guy with a ball and chain along with a ballerina came out of the curtain. All right? They had Michael Phelps one time come out. He had all these medals. He had his rip abs, all these bulging muscles. He's in a Speedo. And I decided not to show that because I thought, you know, I'll be getting emails all week long. Was that you in the Speedo? And I'm like, I don't have time for that. And the reason I find this so interesting is because it works. 30% of people, 30% of shots would be missed when they would visit Arizona State University. But when they started the curtain of, uh, this, this curtain of distraction, when they started that, it jumped up to 40% of free throws were missed. Why? Because they got distracted. Because they weren't focused. Right? It gets in their head. Distraction keeps us from doing what really matters, right? I, I would contend the struggle for most Christians is not being intentionally wicked. It's that we are unintentionally wasteful. We have wastefulness. It's not that we wake up in the morning going, you know what? I want to do evil. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's that we wake up and we have no idea what we're going to do. We have no idea what we're going to do at all. We drift. And when we drift and get distracted, we drift into mediocrity. And see, see it really matters what we stay focused on really matters. It really matters what you stay focused on really matters. And I want to give you a question that is a great question we ought to ask ourselves this Christmas, especially when we're trying to do amazing acts of kindness in our community. Is there, here's a question I want you to wake up with every morning. Here it is right here. Look at the screen. What is the very best use of me? Today, God, what's the very best use of me? Say that with me on count of three. One, two, three. What's the very best use of me? I think we would, we would manage our life differently, better, if we'd ask ourselves this question more often. Because if we're not intentional with life, we allow ourselves to drift into making really big investments of our time and our energy into things that count very, very little. Now, you've heard the phrase, the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. You ever heard that before? The main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. So the question is, <laughs> what's the main thing? Look what Scripture says. It says in Galatians chapter 5, it says this, the only thing, the only thing, the only single thing that counts is faith expressing itself through what? Through love. That's the only thing that counts. Isn't that amazing? The only thing that counts, there is no better use of you than to love well. In fact, any use of you divorce from love is a waste. And you think, well, that sounds pretty extreme, Pastor. Where are you getting that from? I'm getting it from our daily Bible reading. Here's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13 in the love chapter. He says this, if I speak in the tongues of men or angels but do not have love, I'm only, look at this, a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge and I have faith that can move mountains but do not have love, man, I am nothing. And if I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I, look at this, I gain what? Nothing. And here's what he's saying. Nothing counts without love. He's saying that you can be very articulate. You can say some powerful things, but if it's not motivated by love, it doesn't count. You may be smart and maybe you'll have great theological knowledge, but if it's not motivated by love, it counts. It doesn't count at all. Your faith may literally make immovable things move, but if it's not motivated by love, 
That doesn't count either. You can, you can be known for how giving you are and how charitable you are, but if it's not motivated by love, it doesn't count. If you die for the cause of Christ and you don't love the people who are persecuting you, it doesn't count. Now, I know that sounds extreme. It surely accounts for the people that you help, but from the perspective of heaven, no credit is given. No credit is given. Here's how heaven does math. Anything minus love equals nothing. Anything you do minus love from heaven's perspective equals a big fat zero. And if you live an unloving life, you live a wasted life. That's why Paul would start the next chapter in our daily Bible reading. He said, let love, look at this, let love be your what, church? Be your highest goal. That's your highest goal is to let love be your highest goal. Love is the best use of you. One time a lawyer comes up to Jesus and says, hey, there's lots of different things to know and lots of things, things to follow. So Jesus, what counts most? And Jesus, I want you to know, he doesn't say it's all the same. He doesn't say that. He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. And then he says, love your neighbor as you love yourself. That's what counts. Another way of putting it is L1 and L2. Carmen had you do some hand motions earlier. I'm going to have you do the same thing, all right? Put your hand up, all right? Let's do L1, L2. One more time. L1, L2. I can't really do it, all right? L1, L2. You think I'd have it down by now. L1 is love God. And L2, here it is, love people. L1, this is what, this is what counts most, more than anything else. Love, love God. Well, how do you show your love for God? You love people. L1, L2, that's what counts, not in principle, I'm talking about in practice. We can talk a good game, but what counts most is when love hits the streets. It's like the other day I looked at Rachel and I said, I love you. Man, I would die for you, Rachel. That's my wife's name, by the way. You're like, who's Rachel? All right, that's my wife's name, <laughs> Rachel. I would die for you, Rachel. She looked at me and she said, you say that, but you don't do it. I'm like, ooh, that hurts, man, that girl. She don't mess around. She's trying to have a moment. All right? But what matters is what we do. Love that counts is a verb. And love that's easiest to see is when it's hardest to do. Love that's easiest to see is when it's hardest to do. Here's why. Because love counts most when it is most difficult. A lot of times we go, okay, that's loving. Well, let's look into it a little further. There was a pastor. He was in an airport during Christmas, and bad weather happened, all these flights got backed up. And so they have to go back to the ticket agent. And he's going to the ticket agent, he's in line, and he's the next one in line. There's a guy at the ticket counter just reeling and yelling at the ticket agent. Just mad at her. She can't control the weather, but he's just letting her have it. And he goes on and on and on. This guy's watching, this pastor's watching, and this, this girl stays as cool as a cucumber. I mean, she doesn't act up. She's just gracious the whole time through. And finally, he stomps off, and the pastor steps up to the ticket counter. And he just says, I just got to know something. What's your secret? What's your secret? How were you able to stay so calm when that guy was yelling at you? She says, it was sim it's simple. Like, he's like, simple? How could it be simple? She says, that man's going to New York City. While he was yelling at me, I sent his luggage to Mexico City. <laughs> it looked loving, right? <laughs> you see, I know if I asked, you know, how are you doing this whole love report card, man? You would give yourselves probably pretty good grades. But here's the thing. We give ourselves too much credit for a love that doesn't take too much effort. See, most love, there's an investment. There's something about you I seem desirable. There's some encouragement I get from you. Something about you fills me. And so, in other words, I love you some because I love me more. And Jesus says that kind of love doesn't count very much. Like my wife, Jesus just kind of tells it to you how it really is. Look what he says right here in, in Luke chapter 6. If you love only those who love you, why in the world should you get credit for that? Even sinners love those who love them. 
He's saying people who aren't even faithful, people who don't have the Spirit of God inside of them can love like that. But they can love the kind of love that gets them something in return. Like they, anyone can do that. Jesus is saying that doesn't count because that is not really loving. It's bargaining. I will love you if, I will love you if you stay pretty. I will love you if you keep weight off. I will love you if you treat me kind. I will love you if you don't hurt me. I will love you if you're successful. But Jesus says that the love that counts isn't based on return that I get for an investment. The love that counts most is not when it's if, but when it's even if. (laughs) But when it's even if. Because that's the way God loves And I just want to take a moment and ponder the enormity, the vastness of God's love. There's a pastor in Kentucky, his name is John Weiss, and he put a list of A to Z of all the people that God loves, or just a sampling of it. And so I took that list, and I kind of tweaked it for us here, and I just want us to focus on a moment from A to Z, all the vastness of the people that God loves. You ready for this? Here it goes. Let's start with the letter A. A. God loves ambulance drivers, accordion players, airline pilots, artists, astronauts, acrobats, the Amish, the Anglicans, astrologers, adulterers, atheists, and addicts. B, God loves babies and Bible readers and Baptists and boy bands. He loves blondes and brunettes and old women with blue hair. And thank goodness bald people. Can I get an amen, all right? He loves the bullied and the bully. He loves brave people, bossy people, and burned out people. C, God loves Canadians and Cambodians and Cubans and even Mark Cuban. He loves congressmen, crooks, cheaters, crystal meth junkies, and this is hard for me to say, cat lovers, all right? D, God loves dads. He loves Puff Daddy, P Daddy. God loves deadheads and deadbeats, drag racers and drag queens. He loves disc golfers and disc jockeys and Duke skeletons and Dukes of Hazard and thank goodness Def Leppard. E, God loves Elvis impersonators and environmental activists and evolutionists and Eminem. F, God loves the faithful and the fearful. He loves people from Finland and France and thank goodness Florida and even people who think Philippines is spelled with the letter F. Gee, God loves good people, grateful people, generous people, greedy people. He loves glamorous and gullible people. He loves grouchy and goofy people. He loves people who collect garden gnomes. H, God loves homosexuals and people who are homophobic and all the homo sapiens who are in between. I, God loves people from India and Indiana and introverted people, intense people. He even loves IRS auditors. J, God loves a late night talk show host named Jimmy Fallon or Kimmel. J, God loves singers along with Justin Timberlake and Bieber. K, God loves Chloe, Courtney, Kim, Kylie, and Kanye Kardashian. A little joke there. L, God loves people of Laos and people who feel lousy about themselves. He loves librarians and landscapers and lawyers and people and moms who pack lunch boxes. M, God loves ministers and missionaries, Mennonites, Methodists. He loves people who are malicious, meticulous, mischievous, and mysterious. He loves people who collect marbles and those of us who've lost our marbles. He loves Madonna and Miley Cyrus. And God loves Nick Jonas, Nick Cannon, Nick Nolte, Nicholas Cage, uh, Nicole Kidman, Nicki Minaj. Oh, God loves opticians and orthodontists and oncologists and people who write obituaries. P. God loves preachers and pimps and prostitutes and pill poppers and pedophiles and the police who arrest them. Q, God loves the Queen of England and band members of Queen and Queen Latifah. R, God loves the people of RCC. Amen. Amen. He loves Russians, Rwandans. He loves real estate agents and the wonderful people who refill my Coke Zero and restock Bluebill. Amen. So Bluebell. All right, S, God loves the people of South Africa. Any South Africans in here? Any South Africans in here? All right, there they are in the back. We got South Dakota, South Carolina, South Side of Chicago. He loves smokers, strippers, and serial killers. T, God loves Tom Hanks, Tom, Bru- uh, Tom Cruise, Tom Brady, Tom Jones, Tommy Lee Jones. God loves telemarketers and even televangelists and their own Trevor Lawrence. You, God loves people from United Kingdom, United Emirates, and United States. He loves umpires and ushers, usher, and our own RCC ushers. Can we get up for RCC ushers who help us every single Sunday? We love you guys. 
V, God loves vegetarians and vegans and people of Vietnam and Virginia. W, God loves Will Ferrell and Will Smith and Will I Am and William Shatner. God loves waitresses of Waffle House and the woman who weighs you at Weight Watchers. Yeah, even her. X, God loves x-ray technicians and people who name their son Xavier. That's as good as I could come up with for X. All right. Why? God loves you. Y-O-U. God loves tall you, short you, old you, young you, employ you, unemployed you, popular you, outcast you, sad you, confuse you. God so loves you that he sent his only one and only son to die for you. And last but not least, for you cowboy fans, God loves Zeke Elliott and those who are preparing for a zombie apocalypse. Can we give it up for all of God's love? It is vast. It's enormous. And you might not be clapping because you're thinking to yourself, some of those people would not be on my list. And we make up our list all different, but let me tell you right now, God does not do that. God doesn't love people because of who they are. God loves people because of who he is. That's why you can count on God. Jesus says there's a love out there that counts because it doesn't go out basing its love on how people respond and give back. It's a love that reflects on who God is and how he has loved us. And that's why we don't view love as an investment Jesus says this, he says this, love your enemies. You're like, really? But through Jesus, you can do this. You can do good to them, lend to them without expecting to be repaid because love is not an investment. And then your reward from heaven will be great. And you'll be truly, you will truly then be acting as children of the Most High. Why? He is kind to those who are unthankful. He is kind to the wicked. You see, love that counts doesn't come with qualifiers. It actually is liberating because now you're free to love everybody. You know I love having fun with people that love cats. Y'all know that. And so um, I want to say something kind of nice about cats. Are you ready for this? All right. We need to love as non-discriminatory as cats treat people. Now think about this for a moment, all right? Cats Cats don't hate you because you're young or old, all right? They don't hate you because you're liberal or conservative. They don't hate you because uh, of your ethnicity. They don't hate you because you're rich or poor. A cat just hates all people, okay? Cats just hate everybody equally. And when we start to understand what God's love looks like, we start to love like that. It's completely non-discriminatory. It's not based on who the person is, it's based on who God is. See, in our minds, we think we're doing pretty good with this whole love thing. You're like, I don't do bad to people. I don't push people down. Jesus didn't say don't do bad. He said do good. <laughs> do good to them. There's a photo right here. You're going to see a guy's image, but you don't know his, his face, but you know his name. His name is Dr. Henry Heimlich. He's the guy who invented the way that someone's choking, you come behind them and you press upon their abdomen and whatever's blocking the air passageways comes out. And since 1974, this technique has been accredited with saving over 100,000 lives. Well, let me tell you the rest of the story. In May of 2016, uh, Dr. Heimlich is in a senior center. And it's just before he died. And he's sitting next to someone having lunch. Her name is Patty Reese. And all of a sudden, she starts to choke. He gets up, comes behind her, puts his arms around her, and he does the technique on her, and out comes a piece of meat with a bone on it. He saved her life. It was the very first time that he used his own technique to save somebody. He had been teaching it for decades, but he never actually did it. And so we're talking about what love looks like, but Jesus says, love that counts is what you do. It's a verb. And one thing that holds us back is like, yeah, 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 but if I do good to people that are hard to love, they're not going to appreciate it. <laughs> if I do good to people that are hard to love, man, they're not going to respond, and it would not be a good use of my time or my energy or my effort because it would be a waste. Now think about that for just one second. Is it ever a waste to treat people like Jesus did? Is it ever a waste? Now, now think about Jesus who, who was Judas who betrayed him. Was it a waste 
for Jesus to love Judas for three years? Was it a waste for Jesus to, to wash Judas' feet the night before he dies? Was it a poor use of Jesus? I would argue that it was not. It's never a waste to love like God loves because you're offering that love to God. Amen. It's an act of worship. It's never, it's never a waste. And it's an evidence, though, that the Holy Spirit has control of your life because that love is not natural. That kind of love is supernatural. <laughs> that love is supernatural. And Bob, Bob, Paul talks about this when he says in Romans 5, and this hope will not lead to disappointment for we know how dearly, man, God loves us. Because he has given us, look at this church, he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with what? With his love. He gives us the Holy Spirit which fills our hearts with his love. And what God does, he pours in our hearts and this love is so immense, so enormous, so generously given. It overflows and it splashes on the people around us. That's how this is supposed to work. And nothing counts more than this. A guy uh, named Brandon Moody, his uh, uncle was a, uh, a pastor. He goes to visit him during Easter. I know it's Christmas time. Let me talk about Easter for a moment. He goes to visit him during Easter and they had the Easter pageant that's taking place. You see all the things that led up to Jesus' crucifixion and then on to the resurrection. After the resurrection, the actor playing Jesus gives the great commission. And then he's supposed to rise up in the ceiling. And so the guys in the back start, they got him, you know, the actor playing Jesus all tied up with knots and everything in a harness. And they start pulling Jesus. Jesus, and he starts ascending up, you know, the great ascension. Well, apparently, they didn't have stick them on their gloves or something because all of a sudden, the ropes get loose, and here comes Jesus coming back. I mean, he, the ascension started. Here comes the second coming all of a sudden. He's coming down, and by the time they stop, they got a hold of the ropes. He's about two feet off the ground, and he's just hovering above the stage. And the guys playing the disciples of Jesus, they don't know what to do. The actors don't know what to do. And so all of a sudden, the guy playing Jesus, who's now hovering above the stage, just kind of ad-libs. And he says, oh, by the way, one more thing. <laughs> Love one another. And then they pull him back up in the sky. Our seat, listen to me, the best the best use of you is to do that. Love one another. But here's the problem. We nod our heads. We go, yeah, pastor, I get it. That's right. But then we drift. We get distracted. We drift into patterns that require the best of us for things that count for so little. And I think the chief reason is why we do that is because we're living on empty. I mean, God is pouring his love into you, but you have a hard time just accepting unconditional love and so you compartmentalize his love you damn it up and so you have this heart that really wants to be empty it's so be filled it's so empty and so you fill it by giving yourself to something you give yourself to someone in hopes that they'll fill the void in your heart and here's the truth if God's love isn't your absolute you're going to look for a substitute <laughs> if God's love is not your absolute you're going to look for a substitute, and we go looking for love in all the wrong places, right? As the song used to say, because we live in a world that trades for love. And it's so hard for us to grasp the one thing that counts more than any other. And here it is. You can always count on God's love. Amen, church? You can always count on God's love. We experience so much conditional love in this world, and it's just so hard for us to just to understand and count on that kind of love. You hear me preach, you go, I know God loves me, but God would love me more if I didn't have that abortion. God would love me more if my marriage was still together. God would love me more if, you know, I didn't drink so much. God would love me more if I knew the Bible more. Listen to me. You can't start doing anything that would make God love you more. You can't stop doing anything that would make God love you more. And the reason why his love never fails is that it, it was never based in your nature. It's always been based in his nature. 
And this is so important and so different than how this world operates. In the world, your love helps me feel valuable. In the world, your love helps me feel like I've got worth. But God doesn't, God doesn't love you because of your worth. Because God's love is not created by your worth. God's love is what creates your worth. You have worth because of God's love. Now, you might need to make some changes, but whether you do or you do not, nothing changes about the truth that counts more than any other truth. You can always count on God's love. And this is so hard because of spiritual warfare. We are battling a lie in between the ears every single day. A lie that is so deep inside of us that we don't realize how hard it is to expel. And I was reading through the Bible this year. I noticed how many times, I was dumped on how many times there were prayers about us getting this one thing. About us getting and grasping the love of God. Like in 2 Thessalonians, Paul says, look at this. May the Lord lead your hearts into God's love. Isn't that awesome? May the Lord lead your hearts into God's love. And maybe you need that prayer. Maybe you need to start praying that over a kid or a grandchild. I'm praying that my grandson, I'm praying that my daughter will, God, you will lead their heart into your love. And it's not like God doesn't love you, but your heart has a hard time believing it, doesn't it? Your heart has a hard time believing it. So Paul prayed this again. Look at what he said. He said in Ephesians 3, and may you have the power to understand. I love that. May you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is. Will you read that with me? Let's read it together. One, two, three. And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, how deep his love is. Now let's say it like we really mean it. You ready? One, two, three. And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, how deep his love is. Can we give God the praise once again for his love over us? It's wide enough, church. It's wide enough to include everybody. It's long enough to last every single day. And it's high enough to cover over everything, and it's deep enough to be everywhere. And we will always struggle to do what counts most until we begin to count most on the love of God. It really matters. It really matters what you think really matters. Philip Yancey is one of my favorite authors, Christian authors, and one reason I love him because he's authentic. He talks about his struggles, his disappointments with God, and how faith works in the midst of how can a good God, you know, be a good God in a world of suffering. He talks about that from a Christian perspective. He's just real, and I love it. And on the way to a conference, he gets stuck at O'Hare Airport in Chicago, and he's there, and he's stuck for five hours. And he starts talking to a lady next to him, finds out she's going to the same conference he's going and he figures out she's a Christian. And so he just, as a Christian leader, he just starts sharing his heart with her, his struggles with faith. And she listens. He goes on and on and on. She listens for a long time. And this wise woman asks him a question. She asks him this question. She says, Philip, do you ever just let God love you? Do you ever, Philip, just let God love you? I don't know what your name is. Maybe it's Bob or maybe it's Sarah. Do you ever, Sarah, do you ever, Jack, do you ever just let God love you? And Philip said this. He says, it, it brought a light in this gaping hole in my soul. All of my involvement in the Christian faith, he said, had, had, I had lost the most important message of all. The story of Jesus is a story about a celebration, he says, of love. And some of you need to do the one thing that counts more than anything else. And here it is. Just let God love you. Will you just let God in this moment right here, right now, will you not think about what's going to happen next, just sit in the presence of God and allow him to love you. 
you need to do what Jesus' brother said. His name was Jude. He wrote this in Jude verse 21. He said this, keep yourselves <laughs> in God's love. If we're going to be a blessing with this, we need to be keeping ourselves this Christmas season in God's love. Will you, this Christmas, keep yourselves in God's love? He's saying it's up to you to live in the constant confidence of God's love for you. It's up to you. And it'll bring out the best in you, and you'll be able to give the best to what really counts if you do that. We need prayer because this is hard for our hearts to understand, to believe. So will you stand with me right now? And I want to encourage you while we're standing, if we can be a blessing to you in any way, our prayer team is up here, and maybe right now you're having a hard time receiving God's love, you need prayer for that. Maybe you know someone else right now in their life you want to pray for. Maybe it's a child, maybe a grandchild, maybe a best friend, a roommate. You're like, you know what? I'm praying. I need someone to pray with me right now. I had somebody tell me right before the service, they're in this room right now. They said, will you pray? We, went, we prayed right then. Said, Let's do it right now. Let's pray together. Maybe you want to receive Christ and receive his love for the first time today. Just like 29 people did last week and more are actually doing today. You want to join them? Come up here and talk to someone on the prayer team and we'll make that happen. Let us know by going to the crosses. You guys online, hit the request prayer button and you can leave that prayer and that need right there at the request prayer button. But right now, we need prayer for this. We need prayer to understand his love. Let me pray over you. Father God, I'm asking that the forces of darkness right now, Lord, be expelled. And that the truth that we're talking about today will permeate our hearts and fill up the holes that are inside of us. Lord, there's so many holes. There's so much void in our hearts. And Lord, we try our best to fill them with things that don't matter. And Lord, right now we're asking you to fill us so we can receive your love. We're never going to be able to love people, Father, until... It's the overflow of your love inside of us. Father, we need to start believing so we can start really receiving your love. And Father, I know there's someone who hears me in this room, online. They're hearing a recording about this right now, wherever they're at. They're driving. I don't know where they're at. God, you know where they're at. They really need this. They need this. They look like they have it all together on the outside, but on the inside, they are barely keeping it together. And Lord, we're counting on a breakthrough of your love to pierce through all the lies, go right into their souls, right into their hearts. We are counting on that to happen right now through the Holy Spirit. Lord, we need your help to, de to believe how good, how amazing, how vast your love really is for us. We pray this in the name of Jesus. And everyone said, amen. So if we can be a prayer to you, we can help you anyway. Once you make your way up here in the front, head the cross. As you guys online know what to do, let's do it right now as we worship the true King, Jesus Christ. Amen, church. Let's give him the glory.
Amen. Can we give God the glory? He deserves our adoration, doesn't he? He does. Awesome. Hey, I want to tell you right now, it's your first time here. We want to give you a gift. So head out there to the Welcome Center and you can pick up one of these. It's got gifts and goodies in there for you. If you want one of these and you don't have one, you want to buy one, if you've been coming for a while, they're $5, not $500, $5, all right? You can grab one for Christmas, great Christmas gifts. On top of that, I want to make sure you know about Toys for Tots. We've got over 300 gifts thus far. Isn't that awesome? 300 gifts for Toys for Tots. That's awesome. These gifts go to the needy in our community. They are gifts unwrapped brand new gifts for kids and uh, boys and girls. And so we're asking you, we're trying to get to a thousand. All right, a thousand. I think we can do it. Amen. I think we can do that. And we need your help to do that. So go ahead. Thank you so much for those who've helped. Thank you those who are going to help. So bring them in by next next Sunday. And don't forget, you're getting ready to invite some people right now to our Christmas Eve service. So how are you going to do that? We're going to do acts of kindness. Let's go show them the love of Jesus Christ. Can we give once again God the praise for his love over us? He's a wonderful God, church. He loves you more than you can imagine. Let's go show the world that love right now. Go be a blessing. God bless.